Well, good morning again. <clears throat> Bethany and Paige, we come together for our Sabbath school today. Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5 in uh, the quarterly. So as we uh, get ready to go into that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for another blessed Lord's Day. And to God, we do pray as you uh, walk us through your Holy Scriptures, that your Holy Spirit would not only help us to understand, but to God, that you would lay these words in the depths of our hearts, that they might be the meditation of our life. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, of course, before we get into Romans 5, we're going to our catechism for today, which is questions 39 and 40. Uh, questions 39 and 40 of uh, the catechism are, uh, question 39, what is the duty which God requires of man? The duty which God requires of man is obedience to his revealed will. Question 40, what did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. All right. Now, whenever we talk about religion or talk about uh, you know, Christianity or any religion in general, you know, the first questions that always get asked is, is well, what does your religion make you do? All right. What what is the requirements of your religion? All right. So obviously, if you are a Jew, all right, you know, the requirements of your religion tells you that you have to eat kosher. All right. And if you are Muslim. Right? There are requirements uh, of being Muslim, especially for women, right? and the way you dress, and the way you present yourself, and the like. Well, when we come again to talk about the Christian faith, right, we need to answer that same question. What does it mean to be a Christian? What sets us apart? And one of the things that the Catechism is wanting to do here is immediately after talking about the benefits that believers receive from Christ, it wants to talk about, well, having received those benefits, what does God expect from us? You know, I mean, we think about that in any part of life. You know, when you get something, right, you, the person giving it to you, right, expects you to use it, right? If you get a gift at Christmas, right, you don't just put it back in the box and put it in the attic, right? You play with it, right, if you're a kid or you take it outside and use it if you're an adult or whatever, Right? So this faith that we receive from Christ, this justification, this sanctification, this adoption, uh, all the glories that come through our spiritual union with our Savior, right, come with a responsibility. Now, that responsibility is summarized for us, as the Catechism will tell us next week, in the Ten Commandments. Here, in these questions, we are told that the duty which God requires of man is obedience to his revealed will, right, which is an obvious thing. You know, obviously if God is going to tell us to do something, we are duty-bound to do it, right? They're not the ten suggestions, you know, as I've heard people say before, right? That they're the commandments of God. They're what we are commanded to do as believers. Now, question 40, of course, tells us the content of this obedience. The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law, right? So again... When we hear this term, moral law, there is some expectations that we understand uh, certain things about the nature of the law. Because, again, one of the things that we have to keep in mind about the Catechism is that it was written as a supporting document to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So it's understood that you've already read Chapter 19 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, The Law of God, and you know what the term moral law means. Well, it's probably good for us to, 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 to define that word. Well, in God's law, as it's stated in chapter 19 of the Confession, there are three types of law. There is moral law, there is ceremonial law, and there's judicial law. Now, the ceremonial law uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It's the law surrounding the ceremonies of the Old Covenant. So, for instance, right, one of the requirements of the Old Covenant was that priests had to be from what tribe? Levi, right? Well, in accordance with the ceremonial law, right, you weren't allowed to eat shellfish. Right? So you can't go to Red Lobster. Right? You can't you know, you know, eat all that good stuff, right? You also can't wear mixed fabrics. Right? Now, how many of us this morning have mixed fabrics on? <laughs> all of us, right? Well, that's a violation of ceremonial law. Does that mean all of us are sinning right now by having mixed fabrics? No. 
Because according to the chapter 19 of the Western Confession of Faith, according to Galatians, according to the book of Ephesians, according to the New Testament, the ceremonial law has been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. So the requirements of the ceremonial law no longer apply in the new covenant. So now we can wear mixed fabrics. We can eat shellfish, right? You, we don't have to trim the edges of our beards, right? Or we're allowed now to trim the edges of our beards, I should say. And, you know, lots of other things that are tied into the ceremonies. However, sometimes when you go read the book of Leviticus or Numbers of Deuteronomy, you know, there are cases where the ceremonial law and the moral law and the judicial law seem to be all intertwined with each other like a ball of yarn. Well, part of the wisdom that we have in chapter 19 of the Confession is that just because the requirement no longer is in effect, right, that we're allowed to eat shellfish now, the principle is still in effect. So one of the things that ceremonial law was doing in the Old Covenant was it was separating Israel out from their neighboring nations. It was testifying that they, as God's covenant people, were not the same as the Canaanites and the Ammonites and the Jebusites. And so as believers, right, one of the things that we are to be is different from the world around us. And we learn that, again, from the ceremonial law. Even if the, the, the meat of the ceremony is no longer applicable today. And so you have the ceremonial law. You have the moral law and you have the judicial law. Now, the judicial law is the law that was native to, you know, the, the term in the confession is theocratic Israel. You know, basically the laws that have to do with civil government in the Old uh, Testament are the judicial law. Now, the judicial law, it says in the, in the confession in chapter 19, expired with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the confession, there's a however there. The however says that where in general equity you know, applies, they are still in force. So basically what that means is, is that when there's a judicial law, you know, for instance, you know, the famous one that's always pointed out is the law about the fence around your roof. Well, obviously, we don't live in a culture where we have fences around our roofs because we don't live on our roofs, right? At least you're not supposed to live on your roof. Well... The principle there is still in effect. You are responsible for your home. You're responsible for the safety of your home. If somebody gets hurt at your house, who's responsible for it? The homeowner, right? And that's still the law today, isn't it? Right? If, if you have an unsafe, let's say that, you know, you have stairs at your house and you have a, you know, a, a rail going up, but you've never bothered to nail it in. And somebody's walking up the stairs and they try to brace themselves on that rail. And what happens if you try to brace yourselves on a rail that ain't nailed down? Right? You're going to go down, right? And what's going to happen when you fall? You're going to get hurt. Can, can you, in a court of law, say that, well, it was there. Uh, they should have known uh, that it wasn't nailed in. No, right? That, that's not going to get you out of tort, right? It's not going to get you out of trouble. Well, that principle, right, is still in effect. So our laws today should reflect the general equity of the judicial law of the Old Testament. Now, that's, again, wisdom, right, how to do that, but the requirement is still there. But when we come to the moral law, as I said, it is the moral law is the Ten Commandments. So, for instance, why do we have laws against stealing? Because the moral law says... Thou shalt not steal, right? Why do we not lie about our brother? Because the moral law tells us to not lie about our brother. And those laws continue in full effect, regardless of whether you're in the Old Covenant or you're in the New Covenant. And one of the things that's important about the moral law to understand is that the moral law did not come into effect at Sinai. Right? You know, the Ten Commandments... Were, were still applicable in the garden as much as they were in Exodus 20. You, know, you see this all over again, the chapters that precede the giving of the law in Exodus 20. Right? In Exodus 16, the uh, people of God are told by Aaron uh, to set aside food for the Sabbath day. Right? So 
Exodus 16 comes before Exodus 20, right? So the Sabbath was already a known thing in Israel before the giving of the law. And of course we know that because what do we see on the seventh day of creation? Right? God rests on the seventh day, right? And so the moral law is always been around and always will be around. And the reason for that is, is because it's a reflection of the character of God. Right? We learn about who our God is through the Ten Commandments. And so the next you know, 20 or some odd uh, um, you know, questions in the catechism are all going to have to deal with uh, the Ten Commandments. They're going to lay out for us in detail you know, what's required of us, uh, not just as believers, right, but unbelievers are required uh, to maintain uh, the Ten Commandments as part of the moral law. Uh, we'll, get, we'll go ahead and close there. And uh, any questions or, or comments and all that? All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the, the fifth chapter of the book of Romans today. Now, Romans 5, in many ways, is kind of the keystone chapter of the book. You know, you know, and when I use the word keystone, what, what is a keystone? It's the, it's the stone that holds everything together, right? You know, when... You're building stone bridges, right? It's the it's the stone you put that fi- finishes the arch, right? That 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 maintains the structural integrity of the bridge. And Romans five kind of fits that uh, you know you know picture in what Paul's doing throughout the book of Romans. Right, the first three chapters have all been about you know again smoking out unbelief, self righteousness. Showing the Jews and the Gentiles that they're sinners and that they're in need of a Savior. Chapter 4 was a testimony to the Jews mainly, uh, to the Gentiles somewhat, but mainly to the Jews that they uh, needed to understand that Abraham and David were saved in the same way that the Gentiles are saved in the New, new Covenant, by faith alone. Right? They're justified by the work of Jesus Christ, by the righteousness imputed by faith. And now chapter 5 is going to explain in minute detail what justification is, how it works, and why it was necessary. And especially why it was necessary that Jesus Christ was the justifier of the ungodly. So let's go ahead and read the first five verses there of chapter 5 of the book of Romans. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. So, you know, whenever we see a therefore in the Bible, right, we have to ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore, right? Well, Paul, again, is transitioning from this testimony of the imputation of, uh, of, of faith, right, of righteousness uh, through faith that, Mo- that Abraham and David have testified to, and if you go back to verse 23 of chapter 4, uh, Paul says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. Right? Now when Paul says us here, you know, we talked a little bit about this in chapter 3, you know, Paul uses us in about three different ways, depending on who he's talking to. Most of the time when Paul uses us, he's talking about Jews. Right? He's talking about his, his brothers in the flesh. But... Here, he's talking about us in the context of the, uh, of the community at Rome, right? The people he's writing to at Rome. So Jews and Gentiles, all of us, right, that these things were written not only for his sake alone, right, not only for Abraham's sake, but for our sake, that we should believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and was raised because of our justification. So therefore, because this is true, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So that is the, the, the fullness of the gospel laid out in explicit terms. 
Right? What has Christ come to do? Right? He has come to reconcile fallen man with a holy God. Right? That's why he came. Because what's the problem? <laughs> right? We fell in Adam. Right? We are dead in sin. We are unable to save ourselves. We cannot fulfill the broken covenant of works. And so somebody has to do it for us. And that somebody is the Lord Jesus Christ, who has, again, justified us by faith and given unto us that justification so that we would have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, of course, one of the things, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, we're talking about, you know, names of religions, right? What, what do we call uh, our religion? Right, Christianity, right? And why do we call it Christianity? Because we worship Jesus Christ, right? Because Christ is the center of our faith. Right? And Christ is the center of our faith because it is in Him that we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And because of that, what is our response to these mighty works that Christ has accomplished for us. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That is the therefore. That is the response that we give to the mighty works that God has done for us. That's why in the book of Revelation, every time the people in heaven are mentioned, what are they engaged in? They're worshiping, right? They're praising the name of God. They're, they're, they're speaking of the mighty works of God. They're testifying to what God has done. They're, they're calling out to God for Him to continue His mighty works, right? Even when they are asking for things, right? The martyrs are at, at the foot, at the foot of the throne, right? They're crying out for vengeance for the blood uh, that has been spilled. And, and what do we see happen in the book of Revelation? The vengeance is poured down, right? The wrath of God is poured down upon the enemies of God's elect. And so because of that, right, we rejoice in hope, right? We, we don't come on the Lord's Day morning, you know, in kind of blind expectation that something's going to happen. And we need to be there or we're going to miss it, right? You know, it's true, right? We need to be there or we're going to miss it. But you, know, you think of the, uh, the image of the man who was waiting at the pool of Siloam. Remember, you know, what, what happened there? He went to that pool every day, right? Because what happened? Remember, the water would come and it would disappear, right? And when the water came, what did you need to do? You need to get in the water, right? Because if you got in the water, what would happen? You'd be healed, right? But this poor lame guy, what did he not have? Right? He, didn't have he didn't have anybody to take him down to the pool. So he's sitting there every day waiting for somebody to heal him, right? Somebody to, to deliver him into fullness, right? And, of course, who shows up uh, to do that for him? <laughs> right? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? And, and one of the testimonies there is that, you know, for us... Who is our pool of Silo? Like Jesus, right? And now, we are not like him in that we go, or the lame man, we're not like him where we go, you know, and hope somebody takes us in every Sunday, right? We go in the certain assurance of the hope and the knowledge that Christ has not only done this for us, but that he does this for us all the time, Right? You know, we're not waiting on somebody to throw us in the pool, right? We know that we always have Jesus who is present with us, who is always interceding on our behalf, who's always, uh, you know, you know, giving us this access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And through that, again, we are rejoicing in that certain hope, that sure knowledge, that assurance that does what for us in verse 3? And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Right? You know, that's one of the things that makes you know, Christians different from the world. Right? When bad things happen to us, how are we to respond? Right? Thanks be to the Lord. Right? 
And of course, is that a New Testament idea? All right, you know, you know, the, one of the verses that is always that I always read at the graveside, you know, that's in the old Book of Common Prayer is from the Book of Job, right? And, and what does Job say? The Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? And the reason why those words are so comforting is because the sure and certain knowledge that Job have, has and that we have, not only of the resurrection, but of the certainty that if God brings something upon us, right, it's for our benefit, right? It's for our blessing. Now, as sinners, do we always see that? Do we always even know that? No, right? And, and when are we going to find that out? When we get to heaven, right? That's one of the things that happens in heaven, right? Is we are awakened, right, to the providence of God. We, we, we see, you know, clearly, you know, again, what the Lord has done. But again, what allows us to glory in tribulation is knowing that tribulation, tribulation produces perseverance. Now, perseverance is a, is a great quality to have. Right? Because, you know, what, what's so important about perseverance? Right, but it's something that certainly stands out in, in a person, right? Because, you know, we live, we live in an era of what I like to call quitters. <laughs> we, we, we live in an era of people, when things start getting hard, what do they do? They quit, right? You know, they quit their jobs, they quit their marriages, they, they quit life in general, right? But what enables you or any believer to persevere through dark providence? Right, the sure and certain hope, right, the grace that we've received and the sure and certain hope of the future reality that we have in Jesus Christ. But it's not just even the future reality, right? It's the ever-present reality that we have in Jesus Christ, right? You know, that's, that's one of the reasons why Daniel is such a, a, a blessing, you know, to the believer because, you know, what enabled David to survive the lion's den? And it wasn't the fact that he had, you know, some kind of extra shot of Superman grace, right? It was the sure and certain knowledge that God had made a promise to him that he would see the end of the exile. And is a lion going to get in the way of the providence of God? No, right? So that's what enabled him was that sure and certain knowledge through grace to this access by faith that is available to believers, right? Because tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. Right? Now, again, that's what enabled uh, David to, to fight Goliath, right? Because the tribulations that he had experienced with, you know, the animals who were attacking his sheep when he was a younger man, right? Because he had gained the upper hand. And even when he was a younger man, who did he give credit for those victories over the animals? The Lord, right? God had given him that. So when he shows up with all these whimpering Israelites and Goliath, what does he say to his brothers and to the Israelites? Right. Who is your God and who is their God? Why are you afraid? Right. And that, again, is what enables him to win the victory of Goliath. It wasn't just the fact he was good with his weapon. Right. It was the fact that he believed and trusted in the power of Jehovah versus the God of the Philistines. And that's, again, what Romans 5 is pushing us to understand about the nature of our God in faith, right? In this justification that we've received from above. Because again, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Right? That, again, is the message of the gospel. That's what we preach to unbelievers. That you don't have to become good in order to receive grace. Right? You don't have to get your life together before you can believe in Jesus. Right? Because what's the only way you're going to get your life together? <laughs> Through Jesus, right? 
Through the gift of grace. Through the, the, the hope of the glory of God. Through uh, the way in which, right, the grace given by faith enables you to endure tribulation. Right? Because, you know, when you get your life together, you know, using that as a euphemism for whatever, right, is that something that happens in five minutes? Right? Do you become a believer and then all of a sudden you're making all the right choices and you're doing all the right things and everything's wonderful? Right? Is that how that works? No. <laughs> right? You know, when you're getting things together, right, there's a lot of pieces that need put back together, right? There's a lot of dross that needs removed, right? There's a lot of stuff that needs taken care of. But the only way you're going to take care of any of that stuff is through the grace given by faith through Jesus Christ. Right? And it's through the perseverance of that faith that enables you to get from point A to point B. You know, that, I was uh, you know, reading uh, Galatians yesterday, and Paul there talks about you know, the time that he spent from the Damascus Road until he started preaching in open you know, you know, situations, right? And how many years does he go between the Damascus experience to starting to do ministry work, right? Well, he goes out into the desert for like three years, right, before he comes back. And then it's like, you know, seven or eight more years that he's engaged in learning and in, in witnessing with Peter and with the disciples. You know, the book of Acts, you know, kind of like movies do this, right? They, they make time shrink, right? But, you know, the book of Acts takes place over a long period of time. And... You know, the, the Chronicles do this a lot, right? Where the book of Chronicles will have a chapter and then they'll say, so-and-so did this. And then this happened. When you go back to Second Kings and you're like, there's like 40 years in the midst of this one little verse, right? Well, you know, that's again, the testimony we have of Romans 5 is a reminder that God works at a different pace than we do, right? God works in his time for his purpose and in his way. And part, again, of growing in faith is resting in the fact, right, that God's schedule is different from ours, right? His, his, his ways are different in the world, right? Because what does the world want? Everything right now, everything to change immediately, right? That's why every ad on television is about what? How to fix it right now, right? You know, do this uh, you know, workout plan or take this pill or, or, or you know, wear these clothes or, or whatever it is, right? And things are going to change overnight, right? And is that how that works? No, right? You know, because the quickest way to lose weight is amputation, right? But that's not exactly the, 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 the best way to go about that, right? The best way to go about losing weight is slow and steady, you know, every day, right? You know, doing what's necessary, working out, eating right, right? All the things that are necessary, right? And that stuff does not happen overnight. And Paul here again, through the teaching of justification, is showing us that the Christian life is not a get, get well quick scheme, right? That there is, that there is time involved here. But, right, the hope that we have in that is the sure and certain hope that Christ not only enables us to walk this step, but that he's already done it for us. So for whom, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Right. So one of the things that's happening here in verses 6 through 11 is Paul is declaring to us the kind of the, the two parts, if you will, of our redemption that was purchased by Christ. Right. The shedding of the blood, right? The, the sacrifice uh, that was made at the cross. And also, uh, we see again, for when we were enemies, uh, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we saved by his life. 
Right? Because the two things that needed to happen for us to be saved is that our own personal sins have to be washed away, but also, right, the stain of the requirements of the law have to be taken care of, right? Adam's sin in the garden has to be atoned for. And the only person who can do that is Jesus Christ. And so one of the ways that he does that is through the life that he led, right? From the second of his conception by Holy, the Holy Spirit and Mary until he drew his last breath and said, into, my, into your hands to commit my spirit, Jesus kept the law perfectly on our behalf. In every way. And some of the times the way he does that is somewhat strange to us. So, you know, there's two particular uh, events uh, that are important to point out. You know, when Jesus is going about his ministry, right, one of his constant messages to, uh, to his disciples, to others, is whose business is he about? His father's, right? So in the Gospel of Luke, we have this situation where this fella comes to him and tells him to adjudicate, uh, you know, a dispute about a, you know, a, a, about a family matter that happened to do with money. All right. And how does Jesus respond to that? He says, that's not my business, right? You know, there are civil authorities who have been given by God who will adjudicate that matter for you. Now, could Jesus have given Solomonic wisdom and testified how that should be taken care of? Absolutely, right? But why didn't Jesus tell him how to fix the problem? Wasn't his, his business, right? Because that was not his responsibility. He was Jesus of Nazareth, a carpenter's son. He was not a civil magistrate, so it was not his business. And another scene that's similar to that you know, in the principle is in John 8 with the woman caught in adultery. You know, that, that famous scene, right, where Jesus is standing there minding his own business and this crew of Pharisees come with this woman caught in adultery, right? And, and Jesus says probably the thing that everybody knows that Jesus says there, right? What does he tell the group? And you without sin cast the first stone. Right, you without sin cast the first stone, right? But before he does that, remember, what does he do? Right? He bends on the ground and starts drawing on the ground. Now, there's been way too many pages <laughs> written over the years about what Jesus wrote on the ground. Uh, what do you think Jesus was writing on the ground? I don't think he was writing anything, right? I think he was just doodling on the ground hoping these guys would go away, right? Because they're just getting in the way of what they are, right? Because they're like all, all the other times the scribes and Pharisees come to Jesus. What are they wanting to do? Trap him, Trap him right? Well, Jesus ain't got time for that, right? Remember, Jesus tells the disciples not to cast the, the, the pearls before the swine, right? Well, they come up to him, right, and they're forcing him to do something about it, right? And so he says, you without st uh, sin cast the first stone, right? Because the responsibility, of course, in the matter of a woman caught in adultery, according to the law, was who had to die? Both of them, Both of them Right? So when Jesus says that, right, he's not saying we shouldn't judge people, right? What he's saying is, is that if y'all cared about the law as much as you think you do, you'd turn your brother in right now, right? And now the next thing that Jesus says there is another thing that, you know, everybody knows, right? What does he, what does he tell, uh, you know, the woman caught in adultery? Go and sin no more, right? I, I don't have anything against you. Go and sin no more. Now, does Jesus have something against her? Yes, in a cosmic sense, right? That's why when he, whenever he says stuff like, I've not come to judge, well, that's because they're already judged, right? They don't need condemned. They're condemned already. Well, when he says that to her, right, he's saying, look, I'm not the civil magistrate, right? I'm not the elder in the gate. I am not called at this point in time in history to bring vengeance upon this situation, right? So he does what he's called to do, right? He tells her to go and sin no more. And, and of course, kind of tied into that is, uh, do you think the woman was caught in adultery? Yes. I mean, she was. Right? She's not an innocent bystander in this thing. And so what Jesus tells her to do is, you know, go get right, basically, right? You know, kind of the same thing he tells the woman at the well in John 4. You know, I know your sin. I know what you've done. Right. 
And of course, her response is the same as the response of the woman caught in adultery, right? Because traditionally, who do we understand the woman caught in adultery is? Mary Magdalene, right? That, that's tra- Now, whether it is or not, right, we don't know for sure, but traditionally it's understood that it's her. And of course, what do we see from Mary in the rest of the gospel? Right? She's this far away from Jesus at every moment, right? And she's constantly serving him. Well, Romans 5 here again is testifying to the fact, again, that Christ, who has died for our sins on the cross, who has kept the law perfectly for us, has atoned all these things for us, and he's done that because that is how we are reconciled to the Father. Therefore, justice through one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. So again, the question that's always asked is, is, is it fair for us to be condemned because of a sin that Adam did? Right? You know, and in one sense, right, you know, when we ask, answer, ask that question, you know, we're trying to say, look, I didn't sin how Adam did. Right? Why am I held responsible for him? Well, Jesus is, or Paul is going to answer that for you right here. Right? He's going to tell you, you know, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So... Paul answers that question about fairness by saying, you know, do you want fairness or do you want fairness, right? Because if sin entered by the one man, how are we saved? By the grace of the one man, right? So just as Adam was the covenant head of the covenant of uh, of works, Jesus is the covenant head of the covenant of grace. And we are saved again by that covenant of grace Because the one man has taken death and destroyed it, right? Done away with the requirements of the law, which we're no longer held by, right? We're held again in the arms of the one who has given us grace. We'll close on that, but any questions or or comments or anything? All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the time uh, that you bestow upon us to rest and trust in your word. And we pray as we continue to worship you on this day that your hand be upon our hearts and you might strengthen us in every way through your Son. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.